Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rebecca Ross. I'm the director of the Graphic Communication Design Program at Central St. Martin's University of the Arts London. Today is February 16th, 2021. Um, the UK has now been under quite a strict national lockdown since Christmas. Our buildings are mostly closed and we are continuing to do all of our learning and teaching online for the time being as we await government announcements and get a sense of the impact of the first phases of vaccine rollouts. So I am once again hosting this evening's event from my flat, which is in London, around two miles along the Regent's Canal from our usual location at the graphic design studios in the Central St. Martin's building in King's Cross. This is the fourth event in our program's first ever online lecture series titled Depth of Field, which also happens to be our first public lecture series. I'd like to once again extend a warm welcome to all of the GCD students in the UK and around the world and our guests, whether listening in listening live or tuning in later. We hope that everyone is staying safe. On our depth of field website, which is csmgcd.net slash lectures, you'll find an introduction to the series and some more links and information related to tonight's event. I'd like to also remind everyone that we call this a lecture series, but it isn't actually made up of long lectures. Most of the events follow a standard format, which is designed to foreground conversation. We invite two different speakers, on the basis of some kind of interesting and relevant connection between their work and our field. And together I work with them to co-create a specific focus and title. And then each participant takes a brief 15 minute turn to share some examples of their work and provide some ideas and themes for discussion. And from there, I will moderate um, a discussion which will draw in questions from our audience on YouTube. And as a reminder, if you do wanna participate in the discussion, you will need to log into YouTube. So for tonight's event, um, we once again have two fantastic speakers. We have our own Jasmine Morris, who joined as our lead digital tutor, lead tutor in digital on BA graphic communication design here at CSM in September. I'd also like to warmly welcome Irun Kang, who is the founder of the interdisciplinary studio Math Practice and assistant professor of interaction design in the communication design department at Parsons School of Design. So the title of the event is again a question. And the question is, how should creatives interact with the dominance of the tech sector? Um, to set the stage for what we'd like to get at with this line of questioning, I'd like to share a recent personal experience. So I use FaceTime to keep in touch with my nephews in New York. On a recent call, my younger nephew, who is actually turning four today, was frustrated that it was dark on my side of the call. It was afternoon for him and it was evening for me. In response, he shouted, Alexa, turn on the lights at Aunt Rebecca's house. This of course was funny and didn't have any effect, but it also provided a scary glimpse into the ways in which many of our mindsets are being reconfigured by our increasing dependency on digital products and services and the associated unintended consequences, such as the proliferation of misunderstandings of control and power. The starting point for this event is to interrogate the agency of graphic and communication designers, as well as other creatives in relation to the social, cultural, political, and ethical implications of recent developments in contemporary tech. Designers and creatives, whether working with, within, or around tech, play an integral role in the success of most platforms, hardware, software, services, and games, but it is not clear how we should position ourselves in relation. So we're going to uh, try to approach this line of questioning from two standpoints and then see how they interact. Jasmine is going to begin from the perspective of young designers needing to find secure work in an unequal and rapidly changing economy. Irun will follow this by drawing out some of the daily ethical challenges around tech inherent in professional design practice. This is from our relationships to our tools, to the decisions we make about who to collaborate with. So the ambition for this discussion that the ambition, our ambition for the discussion which will follow is to challenge ourselves as a program to take a more active and critical stance in relation to the conflicts and contradictions around tech faced by design students, graduates, professionals, and also ourselves as educators. Um, so I'm going to, uh, um, um, Jasmine, uh, sorry, Rune is going to speak first. Um, I'm going to introduce Rune. Um, Irun Kang is Assistant Professor of Communication Design at Parsons, the New School for Design. He's also the founder, as I mentioned, of Math Practice, an interdisciplinary design and research studio um, with interest in studying, evaluating, and criticizing complex systems and its pursuit 
of efficiency and the pursuit of efficiency. As many of you will know, Parsons is based in New York, but Rune is actually joining us from Seoul this evening, where it is 2.30 in the morning right now. And we had originally thought he would be back in New York by this point where it's the middle of the day, but this didn't turn out to be the case. And I would like to therefore offer an extra special thanks to Rune for managing to stick with our plan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to you now. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled to be uh, part of this uh, lecture series today. Um, so uh, yeah, hi again, my name is Irun Khan. Uh, I run a um, independent design studio as Rebecca mentioned called Math Practice. And uh, before I go any further, let me actually start to share my screen. And I hope this is visible to everyone, is it? Yes, okay. So yeah, uh, I like I said, I run an independent design studio called Math Practice. And I also recently uh, co-founded a research lab slash uh, consultancy called uh, 908A. I can tell you a little bit more about this later uh, in this presentation. And uh, yeah, I also teach at Parsons as an assistant professor of interaction design. Um, in my studio for the past uh, 10 years or so, I worked with um, educational institutions and cultural institutions or uh, culture festivals, making usually visual identities, websites or publications. Um, but actually, I'm not planning on talking uh, in detail about these projects today. Instead, we'll, I think we're going we're gonna to talk more about my obsessions. Um, this, is, uh, this is from my, uh, my master's thesis. It was titled, titled as a Rethinking Inefficient Disciplines of Efficiency, which uh, speaks about my obsession with this kind of notion of efficiency. In other words, I guess I like to think about the design of design of the processes of getting things done in a in an efficient manner, or kind of uh, conversely, I I find it fascinating if something is seemingly completely inefficient, and I kind of find beauty in the systems that inhibit these kind of characteristics and um, enjoy the tension between the two, and uh, because I like to think about in efficiencies and inefficiencies. I also like to think about time a lot, which is, when you think about it, the ultimate kind of standardization force in the world, which enables this notion of efficiency. And a few years back, I worked on a project called uh, In Search of Personalized Time with uh, my collaborator, Taeyun Choi, with the um, inaugural grant from uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Arts, um, Art Plus Technology Lab to uh, kind of materialize this thing called a uh, personal census of time. I mean, we called it personal census of time as sort of an antithesis to the globalized centralized time. And the idea was to ask a question to ourselves, like can we conceptualize an alternate time system, sort of a bottom up approach towards where we collectively decide on what time it is now based on our individualized personal senses of time, as opposed to the top-down approach where everyone's time is based on a planetary movement. Um, similarly to the topic of time, I also like to think about the global logistics, which is enabled by these kind of giant containers, usually hidden from our everyday uh, view. Like time, this is a giant uh, standardizing force which enables big corporations to be born, like which is kind of the topic of the day. Um, this is the uh, from 2013, my um, iPhone 5 package tracking information. And to me, it is absolutely mind boggling to think that the, the phone that I ordered in New York on my, from my computer enabled this um, enormous chain of physical activities, the uh, air travel from China, then the sort of the interstate highways in the United States, which will probably result in a sleepless night in a truck driver on September 24th, I think. 
And I think, and kind of, I, I think about the fast food restaurants on the highway, the rest areas kind of filled with the, with the truck drivers and the piles of boxes and stuck kind of uh, these boxes stacked up at the local uh, sorting facilities. And uh, many artists have kind of documented these scenes behind this layer of abstraction, if you will. Um, Edward Bartinsky, of course, has created a photo photography series called uh, Manufactured Landscapes, documenting kind of the factories of Shenzhen, China, where most of the electronic gadgets are made these days. Uh, this is documentary film uh, made by Alan Sekula and Noel Birch, which they created a, I mean, which is titled as a forgotten space, looking at the maritime transportations and beyond, kind of interviewing people from the container ship and from the land kind of involved in this industry. And there's, a, uh, there's also a Korean photographer that I really like named Jo Chun Man, who documented the uh, sort of the industrial spectacles, including the largest container ship manufacturer in Korea, where he worked himself as a welder for many decades. But I think the most iconic thing in the in dynamics of this kind of abstraction and reality, I think is the um, Amazon's buy now button or buy now button that, that, have, that shows up in every single um, online store. And the reason why is that the, the, this, the contrast between the most trivial nature of the single mouse click to this very heavy reality, the sort of the um, orchestration of warehouse and transportation that is really dramatic. And in some ways it is completely deceiving in that sense, but also kind of really beautiful in the same sense. So, um, this is an image that I created for the class that I was teaching at uh, NYU ITP many years ago called uh, Aesthetics of Automation, which has influenced many of the other teaching efforts after it for me. And um, I was mainly discussing the concepts like abstraction, scale, speed, and power structures around automation. And we kind of explore the complex relationship between design and technology. And how the um, history of the development of the two are kind of intertwined and what it means to be a designer in this world. And in this world, I mean, since the, um, I mean, this is, um, this is an image that was pulled from a, um, this article from Forbes in 2015. And I just read the caption that was attached to this one. Since Amazon Mechanical Turk introduced automated task management on the web in 2005, there has been a rise of jobs controlled by software APIs, APIs meaning application programming interfaces. These employers include 99designs, Uber, TaskRabbit, or HomeJoy. There is a growing disparity between workers who make the software above the API and those completing the test below the API. Many jobs that can be parceled out via API will be vulnerable to robot automation, perhaps as soon as 2020. Of course, we're in 2021. Not saying this is perfectly accurate, but I think the trend is kind of clear. But then as a human being myself, born with sort of a natural tendency towards laziness and selfishness, I do like my packages kind of magically delivered at my doorstep. I think it's amazing because I don't have to do anything. And to be honest and completely selfish, I, I want to not care about the inner kind of mechanisms of keeping the price down and shipping it to me in two busy days. I, I just, uh, I actually don't want to know the reality in some sense. But at the same time, like I said, I feel terrible whenever I press this button. I feel like I'm participating in a further abstraction of human labor and black boxing of the manufacturing processes and kind of in support of putting more people under the control of APIs. So that enters to the second part of the story. And this part is about the software. And uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this audience who is completely confused by the, the, the policy around the shift key in Photoshop these days. Um, for some unknown reason, which I can only speculate, 
Photoshop decided to uh, switch the way how the shift key behaves when you're scaling an object. It used to be that you press shift, you keep the aspect ratio as you kind of drag, um, which makes sense considering the key is also used for rotating objects in, in uh, 45 degree kind of increments and moving objects in 10 pixel intervals, right? So shift key makes things uniform, which has been its kind of a defining characteristic since I guess Photoshop version one. Except it's not that anymore, only when scaling the object. Every other scenario is the same, but when you're scaling the object, not, presenting, not pressing the shift key will keep the aspect ratio and pressing the shift key will make it kind of arbitrary. So as a person who likes to think about the behind the scenes of these kind of systems, I'm really curious about the conversation that took place in the meeting room where this decision was made. What were they thinking? and why this decision was made and how does this make sense to them, right? Because it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but then when you start to think about sort of the other changes that they recently introduced and implemented, it kind of starts to make sense. The other thing, another thing that Photoshop introduced is a newly designed kind of a complicated layout for the new dialog box, which is this one. So, What's on the left is a perfectly functioning Mac OS kind of default dialogue that they've been using for many decades. What's on the right is relatively newly designed, overblown and slow new document dialogue. And all the features that you see on the left is kind of stuffed at the right, right side of the dialogue. And the majority of the space in the dialogue, this new dialogue is ded dedicated to my recent items, which I don't understand why they think I keep create I keep create the same dimension of the documents all the time. But anyways, if you navigate to the, to the other items on the top navigation, it says photo, it has document presets and templates. If you go to print tab, it's all the same presets and templates, art and illustration, again, document presets and templates. And I'm pretty sure no professional designer or photographer uses these templates. And that kind of makes it clear who the intended audience is for these updates. What they're trying to do is to expand the market beyond the professionals, meaning us. And in other words, they're willing to sacrifice the professional's user experience to make it friendlier to the non-professionals. Then we can kind of start to understand why there are animated tooltips on the Photoshop toolbar, which I find it fascinating. Some product manager at Adobe needed to boost the new user engagement metric, of course, at the cost of the user experience of the existing core customer base, right? So I think this is kind of the prime example of uh, conflicting visions. The software company wanting to expand and wants more of your engagement, whereas you as a user wants the company to just be reliable and dependable and not cross the lines. But it is challenging because there's less immediate, I guess, financial incentives built in for the companies to uh, do so. So this kind of misalignment is everywhere. Say, for example, in Google Docs, they're interested in us making more documents in their system because that makes us harder to leave the platform, right? Which means more opportunity for them to collect user data and sell more targeted ads, right? Because they're fundamentally an advertising company. So as a result, the new button, which creates the new document is big and large and colorful on the top left corner. And the remove button to remove the, these documents is hidden in the right click at the bottom of the con context menu. So, and you can also see it's not delete. It doesn't delete the doc. It, it simply removes it from the list. And because the system is really good at making new documents and lousy at organizing them, you end up having this lots of untitled spreadsheets and untitled presentation files towards the bottom of your list. And another example that I brought is Dropbox, where it used to be a really simple interaction where I click on the icon on the menu bar in my operating system, it opens the Dropbox folder on my local machine and easy. It is now slowly creeping into my desktop, putting unnecessary stuff there, like search boxes and stuff like that, wasting my attention and energy. So 
again, I mean, here's a way to look at these problems though. Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, market valuation is $1 trillion. Adobe is a $263 billion company. Dropbox is a $9 billion company. Compare that to me, obviously not a $1 trillion enterprise complaining about this stuff. So how do I make sense of this? This, is my, this was my studio in New York pre-pandemic, which I shared with uh, three other designers. One person that I was sharing the studio with was a type designer and a developer, Andy Clymer, who told me an interesting story about the tool kind of design tool landscape um, or the type design tool landscape that many type designers use currently. And Himself and many of my uh, type designer friends were using this uh, software called RoboFont, which I'm sure some of you know as their font editing tool, which has a sort of a basic drawing functionality with uh, also along with uh, scripting capabilities. So you can design a typeface more computationally than other kind of existing tools. And because, of, because the tool is well-documented and extensible, there appears to be a very active community around type designers building their own type design tools in Python. So I asked Andy and like how, how this came to be and like who's behind these things. And he told me basically uh, there, are, there are three people more or less responsible for this landscape, Eric van Blokland and Peter van Blokland and also uh, Jos van Rosen at a type media program in the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague, developing kind of the earlier versions of the software, pioneering the uh, computational approaches to the type design, and also teaching in the school with uh, sort of the philosophy of build your own tools kind of approaches. And the software kind of started as a plugin for a uh, photographer, which was the market dominating tool then. And now it became a standalone tool with an active community around building and sharing software tools that's built by the type designers. And they eventually uh, led to uh, proposing an open source file format for type design projects. And many years later, this community oriented file format is widely accepted in kind of other design type design software. Um, landscape and became one of the industry standard. So to me, this kind of bottom up approach towards defining the industry standard was also kind of parallel to the project that uh, the, to the time project that I mentioned that I, that I was doing with uh, my collaborator, Taeyun. Um, ultimately, it was about uh, these two things are about taking an ownership of time in, in my previous case, and or tools in this case, back from the corporate profitism, if you will, to, uh, to the individuals. So fast forward to today, today with um, another member that I used to share my studio with, uh, Andrew Leclerc, we founded a new research lab slash uh, consultancy called 908A with uh, interest in building software tools that support graphic design workflows and engage in a conversation around more kind of computational approaches in graphic design. So I'd like to just to go through uh, three areas of our interests. Um, one is building micro typographic uh, tools. And an example of such tool could be Adobe's Paragraph Composer, which is a small algorithm that is hidden inside, not hidden, but like bur <laughs> buried inside in this InDesign's Paragraph Palette. Uh, and many, many designers actually struggle with this algorithm every day. And the, the way how it functions is not very well, very well documented because it is proprietary, right? Um, is Adobe interested in further development of this algorithm? I actually doubt it, knowing their intention is more on putting animated tooltips. Um, and also like, like I'm just kind of curious, like, is there anyone building this, these kind of algorithms to, uh, as an alternative to this Adobe's Paragraph Composer? I actually don't know. Um, so like, we're, we're in a way hoping that we get to spend time with these kind of tools. And 
Another area of our interest is logic-based document creation. Um, one thing that we realized is that uh, existing design tools tend to treat document pages as sort of a series of flat surfaces to put elements on, which we think creates many problems in the design workflow. So we think there are benefits in creating a logic-based or rule-based layout principles that kind of further separates a content into a data and representation. And we're kind of hoping to engage in the creation of such models. And these are just some of the examples from, from our previous projects. And uh, another area of our interest is more or less the ground up content management models. And it is kind of in the world of content management systems, if you will, like WordPress or other kind of popular online uh, CMSs. But uh, we think there are, could be a way of creating a more versatile and universal content management models that are built from the ground up to adapt to your uh, project or collection needs. And um, overall, we think there are opportunities to innovate the way how the contents are typically modeled in the current landscape and hoping to engage with this kind of research. And with all this, the question we're asking ourselves is ultimately, can we create new design tools for the benefit of culture and humanity? Um, and if yes, then what does it look like? And how do we sustain that effort financially and, um, and culturally? And well, I don't have an answer to it, but like that's something that we're interested in figuring out. And finally, I'd like to uh, zoom out from kind of everything that I talked about and leave everyone with this work. This is a work actually called work by a Dutch media artist called uh, Jeroen Koymans. And this is my all time favorite. Um, everyone's completely busy working, but nothing gets ever done. And I kind of feel like running a design studio or doing a design projects are often like this. And I'm not sure where, thing, where there's a way out. Um, however, I think it's always kind of important to zoom out and try to think like where we are, what we're doing, collectively and how we can change the landscape. And with that, I and uh, I can stop sharing my screen and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna move straight introduce, into introducing Jasmine and then we'll come back to some of those really interesting points in discussion. Um, if you do have questions, you could start to put them in YouTube and I'll start collecting them up. Um, so um, I'd now like to introduce Jasmine Morris. Jasmine is a creative technologist working primarily in gaming and creative computing education. And her personal practice focuses on complexities within Simulating, game, simulating culture and identity through games and virtual experiences. So Jasmine's recent experiences before joining C CSM in October include, in, include teaching and community outreach work with the UAL Creative Computing Institute, where she is also continues to be affiliated, uh, consulting for Projects by IF, which is a studio that specializes in ethical approaches to data, um, and facilitating workshops for STEMETs, which is a social enter enterprise that supports young women to be engaged with STEM subjects. So I'm really delighted to introduce Jasmine now. Thank you, and thank you, Irun, um, for a really nice talk there. Um, let me get my slides ready, and I shall begin. Okay. This isn't good, someone unmute and let me know that you can't see. Um, okay, so yeah, today we're both discussing this idea of how creatives should interact with the dominance of the tech sector. And as usual, I've took quite a literal approach to that question. Um, and I'm sure there'll be tangents as there always are. So the first thing I'm gonna do is a little experiment. Um, so I'm just gonna do this and see how we all feel about this word. Notice what is happening to your body and your brain. You've probably heard this word a lot. 
Um, and I want you to really think about how you feel and what it does for you, how you relate to this word. So I'm just going to give us a few seconds to ponder on that without it being too awkward. Um, and yeah, the reason I've done this is because it's got to a point where I try to avoid initially saying the word in conversations. I try to avoid the word if I'm titling talks. I do a lot of talks these days and I actively try to avoid putting the word in there. And it's because through my um, experience, I've realized that it can be very excluding. I think we've got quite a diverse audience here. I know even just within the graphic design community, and I know that these talks spread further than that, we've got some computer wizards and they may be feeling like, yeah, I've, I've bossed code. I love working with code. Code is creative. I'm doing a project with code at the moment. And if that's how you feel, fantastic. I also have a feeling that some of us are maybe feeling a bit anxious. Maybe some of us are thinking that's something I really, really need to learn. It's that thing that's on the to-do list that I never get time to do, but I know the world's moving really quickly and everyone around me seems to know how to code and the word is everywhere. And where do I start? There are all of these languages. It's so technical. I'm really intimidated by it. Code is not for me. I'm not clever enough. You know, I'm, I'm not logical enough. I don't know any maths. How could I possibly start to learn code? It's expensive. It's exclusive. And, you know, I'm really aware that they can also be the racing thoughts when we start to think about this word code. Now, coming from a creative point of view, the first thing I'd like to say is that creative computing is way more than code. And I mean that from a physical software point of view. So to be... Uh, someone playing around in the field of creative computing there are loads of other things that you can do and I'll let you in on a little secret I too was really scared and anxious about code and I avoided learning it for as long as I possibly could um so at first <laughs> I learned how to construct virtual reality environments and 3d avatars before I learned how to code because I was so scared of the word and I felt so excluded by it and yes, I have learned and I feel really positive about code now. And I also want to be really transparent though and say that I don't know every language and the languages that I do know, I don't know them in depth. And I actually wish that more coders would come out and be transparent about what they know because I don't think that that helps with the exclusivity around it. It's great to say that you're a coder and to be proud of that, but let's reinforce saying that you're a coder if you've learned one line of HTML. Let's reinforce saying that you're a coder if you sat with a young person and helped them through their schoolwork, you know? Um, so yeah, I avoided code anyway for a long time and creative comp computing can be physical, it can be electronic, it can be experience. To be honest, you can kind of get away with not learning code if that's what you really want to do. But, you know, that's not, <laughs> that's not always the, that's not the plan of this talk. I want to open up the idea of code and create some sort of agency within the narrative. And I put together a few prompts because when I thought about coding, this is what came to mind when I think about creative computing. It's about being logical, having a logical approach. It's about creating experiences for people, whether that's user experience from a more graphic design point of view or, you know, digital experiences, maybe from a gaming point of view or experience design point of view. It's about patience. I think everyone that has ever coded before would agree with that. Have you got patience? If so, please join the club. We need you. It's about innovation. It's about being able to use software in new and exciting ways and even innovate innovative software and really push the boundaries of things that have been made for us as Iron was starting to suggest at the end of his talk actually imagination have you got imagination great come and be a coder we need it it's not boring if you want to do boring code I always say go and do computer science and that's no offense to computer scientists we really really need them but in the field of creative computing it's about imagination and lastly it's about empathy I think to be 
creating software or experience, we have to, and you know, the graphic design, um, CSM graphic design really for, um, pushes this, especially in first year as well. We've got to have empathy as designers, otherwise we, we again exclude people from systems that we're designing. And because technology is so dominant now, and everybody's using it. Everybody needs to have access and everyone needs to feel equal. So start coding from an empathetic point of view to ensure that we don't further exclude people. So if the word code does make you feel a little bit anxious, think about these things first before you look at a long screen of code. And if maybe these, this feels like your jam, if you tick a few of these boxes, as I said, please join because the doors are very open. In saying that, you know, let's quickly speak about why it might be so intimidating. And maybe this is something that we can open up in a chat later. But for me, I think it's the language that's used around coding. There's a lot of inaccessible language. And as I said, for me, the word code has been included in that now. Um, but there's a lot of language. And I think that people like to use that. It's, not, it's, a, it's a power trait, you know? Someone um, once said to me, actually, I was in an exhibition and I'd, I'd, I'd messed it up. I'd messed the ratio up. I, it wasn't ready for an exhibition. And I was freaking out. And I was saying to my friend, the, the curator's on my back. I don't have time. I've messed it up anyway initially. I exported it wrong. I've lost the initial file. And my friend said to me, use really inaccessible language and the curator won't know what you're talking about and you'll get away with it. And it's true. I mean, I didn't do that because it's not really what I like to do, but it's true. We can use, you know, technologists can use inaccessible language to exclude people. And I think that some technologists know that and use it to their advantage. And, and again, to further push people out of the room. And I think it's because some people are not interested in shifting power dynamics and use it as a kind of construct to further exclude. Um, so yeah, I think that language is a big one and representation as well. How often do we see coders that look like me or you sat there at home? How often do we see coders that are mums or dads or coders that are really young or coders that are over 50, coders that are not white, coders that are queer? I don't think we see that in en enough. And I think that's another reason why this whole field has become really excluding. So, you know, on the back of that, if we don't do it, if we don't empower ourselves to start using technology in ways that are for us, um, they will. And I try to define what I mean by they, but I'm not quite sure. The, the only way that I can describe it, and this sounds really kind of, um, I sound like a conspiracy theorist and I'm trying to move away from that, but I think I do mean the elite. Um, and yeah, the people with the power and, you know, they might be different people depending on who you are and who you see as those people with the power. But either way, if we don't, if creatives don't, and if diverse people don't, they will, and we'll continue to get software, tools, products that seem to work against us instead of for us. Um, so yeah, I'd like to kind of start finishing with a few a few kind of, not tips, I don't know what they are, statements. So, you know, I believe that we should embrace technology and empower each other to design a better future. So rather than holding on to that power and that knowledge, the best thing you can do with it is move it forward. And, you know, especially as academics or anyone that feels they are in a position of power, it might be a sibling relationship, you might have a younger sibling, you might teach at an institution, you know, you might, you might work somewhere where you've got access to the general community. And I think it's about opening up these conversations and sharing knowledge with who you can and empowering others around you, which leads me on to this concept of knowledge exchange, which has become really important for me. And it's something I've been working with since I was a student and I think I've kind of redefined the term but I'm, I'm okay with that and it's a big reason of why I teach because it's really important for me to share knowledge and you know often apart from in really formal environments I don't like to call it teaching I like to call it sharing knowledge because 
you all there's there, there's never this hierarchical I am a god and I know everything and I'm relaying this information to you there is often a reciprocation and if we can kind of embed embed that approach into the way that we talk about code and creative computing I think we could empower a lot of really interesting creatives that need their voices to be heard to start using these systems in exciting ways and I think a lot of technologists would agree that you know te technological skills are, are one thing but you know the, the other skills that I mentioned earlier the empathy the imagination the kind of the creativity is really important too and I think maybe sometimes we're lacking that so you know don't dismiss someone if they don't know how to code because you sharing a few lines of code might um, might end up in a really, really interesting project that was lacking some sort of, you know, creative knowledge there. So I'm always pushing sharing knowledge, especially within the creative computing and the general creative industry. And also um, open source. It's become really important for me. I only work with open source tools for my entire practice. I think it's really important to be accessible just because of the point the, the points that I make. It it would be contradictory to when people say, what do you make things with? If it was a thousand pound software, it wouldn't make any sense. So I'm a big fan of the open source community and I use it myself and I recommend it myself as well. And I think it allows for this kind of self-taught um, narrative, which again is really important. We're getting a lot more people that are self-taught and they've been able to have access to this information due to open source software. And there's two communities that I'd like to point out if you'd like to do some further research into any of the things that I've kind of said. Um, and the first one is the Twine community. So I've included a few links um, in the bio actually. Um, so have a look if you wish to. So Twine again is an open source game development tool. It makes um, text-based games and it, I mean, it's very, very interesting what's happened with that community because we've got a lot of queer people on there telling a lot of important queer stories. And I think that the reason that that has happened is because the software uses minimal code and it's free and it's open source. And I feel almost like there was, we were waiting for that tool to express ourselves because for so long, creative computing has been inaccessible. So do check out the Twine community and the, the links that I've referenced. And I'm using Twine myself to tell my stories. And the other one is p5.js, which is a coding language. Um, but um, their community ethos is fantastic. And they recognize initially that creative coding can be hard. Um, you know, it can be exclusive. They say that their software is designed for everyone. They've got a beautiful list, you know, they, like it's fantastic. Please do check it out, their community manifesto. And I am starting to see more and more open, soft, open source softwares being aware of this and opening the doors to a diverse range of people, which is really exciting. And I can only continue to sing the song and continue myself to empower people and hope that it continues. Um, so the last thing I'd like to say is let's work together to redistribute power through creative computing. And obviously I don't know how to unshare my screen. Right, here we go. Okay, hi, great. Jasmine, thank you so much. Um, so uh, that was all really interesting. And I see like a lot of interesting relationships kind of coming through between the two talks. So thank you. Um, I, I was thinking maybe it'd be interesting to pick up on some of the kind of the ways that both of you kind of ended. Um, because I think Rune was talking a bit about starting to develop um, your own tools. And um, Jasmine was talking about kind of ways for, I think, designers to jump into open source initiatives. So um, there was a question that came in from Joanna. Um, and the question was, there's a growing demand to make software and information open source. How can disciplines like art and design that still feel a bit elitist play more of a role in that? And, and I've added to that, 
what are what are the obstacles? So Jasmine mentioned Twine and P5JS um, as as two ways to jump in. I wondered if there was anything else to consider, and and maybe maybe Rune could say something about the ways that um, they're jumping in to, to this new endeavor of starting to make micro tools, et cetera. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I feel like um, there are lots of those tools that are already made by designers, especially in say, uh, uh, for the little tools that are, that people use all the time on the web, for example, like this, um, uh, what am I thinking? Um, say things like masonry, for example, it, mm -hmm. it, that's the one that is, that is designed by a designer that is like widely popular. It is almost like a business model of Pinterest at this point. And um, it's, a, it's a simple layout engine, but it, it is something that is not um, part of the, the, the CSS spec. Um, it kind of behaves, it kind of behaves something, beha behaves in a way that the designers want things to look less of the CSS kind of the spec defines you to kind of do things. So it, it gained a lot of popularity in, in for the past kind of, I wanna say like maybe a decade or so. And then, and then there, there's like, that's, that's not the only one. You can find like, like literally like hundreds and thousands of those, those examples um, that like, sort of like a designer builds tools that are useful for designers, right? And then there mm -hmm. are like more bigger tools like say Paper.js or, um, or like more kind of uh, tools that almost became like a platform, right? So uh, you, can, you can either stop building your own small tools and, and go that way, or also again, like as uh, Jasmine uh, suggested, you can uh, start contributing to the existing uh, open source projects and then find your way in. An interesting sort of related question popped in that Jasmine might be interested in, um, given what you just said about your own software habits. So Daisy asks, both of you have talked about free open source software. Um, in graphic design, like how does this apply? What, what do we do about Adobe is the question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not expecting you to solve that, but do you, but how do you deal with Adobe? Because it sounds like you don't use Adobe, right? Jasmine, yeah, sorry. No, but I just think um, I feel I feel bad because I guess I'm not a graphic designer. Um, so it's it's interesting. I have managed to avoid Adobe, but a lot of the work I make is conceptual. And I understand that if you are coming from a commercial point of view, it might be difficult to avoid Adobe. Um, and I actually, I have a hunch that work is that work that is made on different software is maybe disregarded a little bit more as not as kind of, you know, successful. And I only can hope that that narrative changes. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do avoid Adobe, but... I'm not a commercial graphic designer. So I think it's mm -hmm. easy to be done for me. So I am aware of that as well. Yeah, that's a really important point to mention. And we've definitely been doing mapping of different alternatives, but it is really hard to not engage with Adobe and like design books or something like that. Um, it, would, it would be really challenging. Do you want to add anything to that, Rune? I mean, I mean, uh, not much. Like it is, yeah, I mean, it is really hard to uh, avoid Adobe as a practicing graphic designer. Yeah, it's, it, it might be interesting for us to carry that conversation on as a program. Like how can we, we have to use Adobe. I don't think we can like say that we're preparing a bunch of, of young people or people of all ages actually for a profession that is so wedded to Adobe without using it. But I also think that we, we probably need to question it more and sure. open it more. Um, so um, there's a, um, there's a nice question, actually, like, um, Sunmin Kim asked a lot of questions. Um, but the, one of the questions that the last question that came through was, um, do either of you have any recommendations? And I'm going to, I'm going to kind of merge this with one other question. So what's the best way to get your foot into the tech industry as an entry-level designer and graduate student 
um, or graduate? And, and do you have any advice? And, and I'm going to merge this with some of the sort of ethos in Sun's other questions, as well as in uh, some of the other things that came through the talk. Is there a way to, if you want to gain employment in the tech industry and work in the tech industry, is there a way to do this, keeping some of the ethical considerations in mind? Or keeping some of the ethical concerns in mind? Is there a way to do this? Obviously, you know, people are seeking employment, um, but the, but is there a way to both seek employment and try to change things positively concurrently? I can, are, are, yeah, please. I, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give the same advice that I give to a lot of students for a lot of different reasons. And I think it kind of molds the two. So my advice would be to focus on your practice and your creativity and everything should come secondary to that. Um, and if you are concerned by ethics of anything, politics, society, whatever it may be, embed that into your practice. And, you know, it doesn't have to be something you always do work about. And I know that work with those narratives can become exhausting. And I'm not saying that everyone should be an activist. However, if it's something you feel passionate about, embed it into your practice. And I'd say that's how you can ensure that you always hold on to the ethics and in terms of getting a foot in the door from from my experience um in terms of creative the creative tech industry yes they are looking for um some level of technical skill however if you're a fresh graduate i think they're going to be aware that you know your, your skill might not be as it would be someone that has been practicing for 10 years. And I actually think that it's about the portfolio and your potential of how you could use those skills if you were um, kind of professionally taught or took a, a course or, you know, um, kind of supported a little bit further technically. So I think entry level technical stuff is absolutely fine. If your ideas are strong and what you're saying is strong and the way that you're communicating that is strong, you can always do courses they're not going anywhere this software isn't going anywhere but what's in your brain and how you can convey that is what is unique to you great thank you um something that i was struck with as well in kind of thinking about the um some of the examples that you both presented um is that um i think that uh i guess um there's a discussion of how there's a performance of code as intimidating coming from Jasmine and also um, coming from Rune, we talked a little bit about a, com a kind of common tech tactic, which is maybe to hide super complicated stuff with vast implications behind a really simple interaction, like the logistics behind the buy now button. I think there's a relationship between the two. On the one hand, we have code seeming to be like too hard to, be including and motivating. And so we're trying to devise simpler ways in. And on the other hand, um, we're, we're, um, we've got all this complicated stuff that people need to know about that's sort of hidden behind the opacity of something like the buy now button. And, and, and we're sort of briefed by clients and bosses to sort of reduce friction and oversimplify. So we want things to be simple enough for them to include but then we also we don't want to oversimplify and out and get rid of the nuance I don't know if either of you want to jump in on that it's a big one it's, a, it's also more of a sentence than a a long sentence than a question <laughs> I feel like I'm talking too much but I do okay. the thing that, that made me think of Rebecca um, and please do follow Irun. Um, but I guess the the um, the core difference there though is between being a user and mm -hmm. a developer. And I think that the door, as Irun as Irun was saying, um, you know, these softwares are constantly trying to get new users in. And the reason we're pushed to make user interfaces so accessible is because it gains new users they, I'll refer back to this idea of they, are very comfortable for us to be users. When it comes to being developers, that's when the doors start to close. That's interesting. Um, uh, there's also, there's also something um, about the relationship between consuming and con like, because I think designers tend to sort of hide, designers tend to sort of ride the line really interestingly between being consumers and being producers. 
And I think that they, that, that they, they flick between those two modes in a really sort of really some really insightful ways sometimes. And it, it's kind of interesting to think how that comes into practice. Um, Rune, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, it, that's, a, that's a really interesting point because designers are naturally kind of like very good at working with uh, constraints and kind of bending the rules, right? So they're kind of naturally very good at hacking the system. Mm -hmm. So they're always kind of hacking the system. And that's the thing that I always see with uh, kind of people typesetting with the InDesign um, paragraph composer is that like the people just like hacking the system all the way along, uh, like all the time. And um, in, a, in a strange way, I want to connect this to the previous question, one of the previous question, like how do you mm -hmm. gain the, I mean, is it, um, is it helpful to have this kind of critical viewpoint to these technologies to like when you're trying to get a job there? And I'd say that is uh, absolutely a yes. I mean, I can't say surely because I'm not the tech, in tech industry, but you know, like I, I believe they're smart enough to recognize the problem. And it's, it's usually these, these issues are not a, you know, not a single person's responsibility. It's a group effort. And along the way, it's just the decisions made along the way and like no one's sure how, no one's like certain how that happened. And in many cases, they, they already know the issues and they just don't know how to revert the thing or it takes a long time to revert the thing. So they will absolutely appreciate the critical viewpoint and sort of the kind of the critical thinking that you're bringing in to, to the team, if I have to say. That's interesting, and I also would add. Obviously, we, we, we I've. It's, this is my. I take responsibility for framing this event as like talking about the tech sector in like a really homogenous way. But actually, there's a lot of there's a lot of variety. Sometimes so certain things are perhaps too homogenous, but there also are a lot of different agendas within. And so maybe that there's maybe you, you, what you want to be doing is looking for people to work with who are responsive to and open to sort of a critical point of view um, because it's, it, it, because it, 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 they have a more interesting agenda perhaps. Um, and maybe their agenda has a different relationship to the marketplace than, than others. Um, so this actually takes us to uh, an, an, Anushka, one of our tutors, she asked this question, which is a really hard question. Um, uh, she, she says the masters, this is, she's quoting Audre Lorde here. And the quote, the quotation is, is, would be very familiar to a lot of people, I, I hope. The quotation is, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. And that's a title of a piece of writing by Audre Lorde, um, which is very, was written very much before um, we had the kind of relationship we have to tools that we do right now, certainly. Um, but it's, it's got some interesting contemporary implications, a lot of them. But the, if we're looking to, dis, the, the point that Anushka is asking about, if we're looking to dismantle problematic systems that are perpetuated by tech companies, can we do this with their tools? And, and I think that's a really intriguing question, especially like given what we said about Adobe, but just more generally, do either of you want to take that one up? I'd say it is absolutely possible. Mm. And it's like, I mean, I mean it, it is also um, depend, depends on like how you, how you define the tool, right? If you define the tool as the code itself, as, as Jasmine pointed out, and like it is, it is no, one, no one owns the code, right? So it's like, there's no such thing as the master's tool. It's the, just that like everyone's building the thing with the same material. It's like, that's, that's one thing that I really like about, say, the, the World Wide Web, which I think is really valuable, is that like every, pretty much everything gets to the, and at the end of the day, it's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? Like there are like a lot of fancy stuff that happens to get there, but at the end of the day, that is the delivery mechanism, and it, and and it's like everyone uses that, and you have the same access to the things to, to the tools that the Facebook has and also mm -hmm. Google has, it's the same thing that every single one has. That's sort of the empowering aspect of all this. So you're saying perhaps we need to question how inaccessible or discreet the tools we have are these days. Um, Jasmine, do you wanna to add to that at all? 
can I can only agree. I think that was a fantastic response, Irun, and a really great question, Anushka. Um, and it's one that's a conversation and it's one that's an ongoing conversation. And because Irun has basically taken the words out of my mouth from a tech perspective, um, because I know this question came from Anushka, I'd like to bring it back to academia because I know that she'll understand me when I say that as an academic, do we believe in this big institution we're in and this infrastructure that we're in, you know, or are we here to criticise it and question it and work within it and with it to take it to a potentially better place? And I think a lot of academics, especially at in these troubling times will understand what I mean by that. And I think it is definitely okay to be working with something and within something to try and push it into a new direction. But that's not to say that things that are happening outside of these powerhouses are not really interesting conversations that do need to be highlighted as well. So yes and no, but yes also. <laughs> I think it follows a little bit what I was saying before about sort of writing that line between consumer and producer. Um, and I, I, I think you've done a really nice sort of proxying of uh, institute, like the institution or the tool set, sort of what what is the relationship between an, an institution and a tool set. And, and, and certainly uh, as someone as well who works as in education for a large institution, I, over, over a long period of time, you definitely have to figure out ways to be one foot in the institution and one foot out of the institution. And that's actually, um, it means that you have the, um, that you can put, you can um, make change at a greater scale working through the institution, but that you're not totally subsumed by it. And there seems to be that those dialectics of being kind of on the edges of stuff seem to be really powerful positions from which to be working. And kind of, you're, you're both kind of coming to some interesting places to occupy that are on the edges there. So that's really nice. Um, so uh, I'm gonna let Peter Hall have the last question. Um, and, uh, it's a good one. It's a nice one to finish with. So, um, Peter asks, um, hacking the black boxes seems like a great challenge for designers. Are there any user interfaces or maybe even as well projects, um, that you've seen that effectively open up and expose the workings behind slick interfaces like buy now? Are there any user interfaces that I, I guess, seen? or just designer initiative, does, you know, initiatives? That's a great question. I mean, I'd say, I'd say the the, the type design tools is, is a great example in that um, that I was able to identify, and then, um, yeah, I mean, I. And this is not a direct answer to this, but like one thing that uh, that I that I'm just reminded of just uh, listening to this question is that um, uh, what is it that I'm thinking of? So this um, you know the the way how we uh, compose documents in like Microsoft Word or like any other tools is basically. Like I said, pre briefly touched on in my presentation is that like we're treating these surfaces as like a flat kind of non-hierarchical serialized kind of uh, 2D surfaces. Whereas um, there are there has been other approaches and, and, and there, there are other approaches that are actually actively in use in other disciplines. Say for example, if you go to engineering school mm -hmm. and you were to write uh, like a thesis or like a paper, then you would probably write it on like a tech or LaTeX. And mm -hmm. that is a completely different model of constructing a document. And um, I, I, yeah, I actually find it really powerful. And actually you kind of dig into the history of it. Uh, there's, there's this figure called Donald Knuth, who is kind of the pioneer of this whole thing. And he was a hugely influential in uh, the modern kind of typesetting techniques that we currently use also in InDesign uses. And um, yeah, so there are kind of like these kind of behind the scenes techniques and technologies that are open to the public that is waiting for all of us to be kind of uh, tapped into. 
I want to add two little details to that. One is that um, one thing that so one thing that made okay. So LaTeX been around. You referred to LaTeX, which engineers engineers use to write write to do writing. Really, yeah. um, LaTeX actually has been around for quite a long time. But in the past, like I don't know, ten years, uh, something called Markdown has been created, yeah. and Markdown is a really good example of a of a it's sort of, it was somewhat designer, designers were involved in its creation and it relates to sort of the perpetuation of like clean text editing. But, mm -hmm. um, but Markdown allows, I think the logic of that sort of, if you crack open LaTeX to illustrate Jasmine's point from earlier, it's really complicated looking and you might not understand a lot of it and it might feel really intimidating, but actually you can kind of learn a lot about the relationship between form and content and kind of understand new possibilities for form if you kind of persevere through it. But Markdown allows us to understand the logic of LaTeX, but mm -hmm. actually it's much easier to understand the logic of HTML and CSS, but it's actually much easier to understand and jump into. Um, and it's easy to go from Markdown into the much more technical like LaTeX, but it's also easy to go to Markdown into the much more user-friendly like Microsoft Word. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's kind of interesting. And the other thing that I wanted to throw on the table is it's possible for anybody who wants to, to go into the preferences in our browser and uh, activate the developer menu. And I don't want you to do that to become like intimidated or in kind of overwhelmed by the code. Um, so that allows you to look at the code on almost any anything that you're looking at on the web. And the point there is not to like be like, oh, look at all this crazy code, it's crazy and it's intimidating. But the idea being to like kind of get yourself uh, familiar with like the texture. A lot of it's computer generated. Most of it is computer generated, but it's an interesting way to sort of understand that at any moment you can flip the web browser. You always have that power to like flip the web browser and look underneath and see a taste of what's going on. Even if you don't understand all of it, it's kind of like if you are a driver, um, you probably a better driver if you've looked if you've looked under the hood of the car and you might not know every detail about the, how the engine works but there's like a little bit more of an, a, a sense of the complexity rather than everything feeling all slick and kind of simple all the time so that's something that i would encourage any designers to do with their preferences in web browsers um do, do you want to uh, add anything to finish us off jasmine that was really, I love the way that you described it as taking back hold of the power. Um, <laughs> and I guess, um, you know, Peter's question did make me think of something. It's not completely different to where you two went, but um, the only example I could kind of think of, especially um, looking at this idea of interfaces, um, is the work by Projects by IF actually, and they're coming from a data privacy angle. So they are actively working with brands and, um, you know, companies to help them improve the way that they look at data privacy, because obviously this is a really important discussion that everybody needs to be having, especially designers um, and big, large institutions. And they use interface a lot. Um, so it's not necessarily the buy now button, but it's the buttons that you almost don't see that really affect your privacy settings and really, really matter. Um, so, you know, the, and these interfaces, you know, have been developed to allow us as users to accidentally avoid these settings and projects by if go back into those companies and work with those interfaces to see how we can actually um, com better communicate our privacy settings and allow users to have agency over that from when the first, the first point of contact with the website, the brand, the, the whatever it may be. So I think that they're their UX work is, is really interesting. Um, and it'd be great if they could work on buy now buttons as well. <laughs> yeah, it, that would be really interesting. What would a buy now button from Projects by If be like? That yeah. would be interesting. Okay, well, um, that was all, there was, we hit on a lot of themes. It was all really interesting. Um, my hope as ever with these lectures is that some of these discussion points that the discussions continue in other settings outside of this event and that it kind of gives us momentum to look at kind of the ways that we're working in, in new ways moving forward in the program. Um, so um, I like to just kind of close by just a few housekeeping announcements. Um, 
The next lecture in the series is scheduled for March 9th at 5.30 p.m. UK time, and it will engage with data, data visualization, information graphs, graphics, and identity. And the sort of starting point for the discussion is going to be the W.E.B. Du Bois Charting Black Lives exhibition, which was actually on view at the House of Illustration right around the time we went into the first lockdown last March. And our guests are Silas Monroe from Polymode and Otis College of Art and Design in LA, along with um, Patricio Davila from, Davila from York University in Toronto and the Public Visualization Lab. So please keep an eye on the webpage for the event series, both for future events and to revisit recordings of previous events, including tonight, um, that's csmgcd.net slash lectures. Um, there will also be updates on our social media, which is at CSM Graphics on Twitter and Instagram. And now I'd like to just say thank you Thank you so much to Irun and to Jasmine for the amazing discussion this evening. It was really engaging and I think it's given us a lot to talk about moving forward. I would also like to thank Jacob Watmore and David Frame for their work on the series behind the scenes. So good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.